So this week, after a wonderful break with my family traveling and resting and picking my kid up from camp, I was catching up on the internet, which I had mostly succeeded in avoiding while I was away. And I was poking around Facebook, looking at all your photos with your kids and your grandkids, hanging out with your friends on your boat for the 4th of July, and all these special moments. And I came across a picture posted by the president of Hebrew Union College, Andrew Rayfeld, alongside John Irving, prolific writer of The World According to Garp, Cider House Rules, and dozens of other brilliant novels. Now, the two had spent some time together in Israel, where Andrew was meeting with Israeli leaders and rabbinical students, and John was there for a research trip for his new book called Queen Esther. It's very exciting and for a speaking engagement at the Mishkanot Sha'ananim, which is a cultural center in the heart of Jerusalem. Now, this was John Irving's first visit to Israel in 40 years. It's an auspicious number, no? After all his wandering out there in the wilderness, he finally made it back to the promised land. Now, Andrew's caption of the photo read, what a pleasure and thrill it was to spend an hour with legendary novelist John Irving talking about the importance and centrality of Israel, facing current challenges of extremism and xenophobia, the persistence of anti-Semitism, and his own writing process. I mean, that's, that's very cool, right? Now, John Irving is not Jewish, but in his own words, I've always been pro-Israel, and I've always been pro-Jewish. My earliest exposure to Jews were the wrestling teammates that I had. And they had a hard time. I had a hard time. But we were all doing the same thing together, so it was natural or seemed natural to me that I sort of stood with them. But this isn't an Israel sermon. Many of you out there tonight know that I am a voracious reader, and I have been my whole life. My parents can tell you about me taking, to the, taking me to the library when I was a little kid with a laundry basket filling it to the brim with books, dragging it home, reading on the couch for hours and days, and then dragging it back to the library to refill it the following week, rinse and repeat forever. And it's much easier now, instead of the laundry basket, there's an app for that. But that joy I felt as a kid immersing into a different life, a different world, that mind-blowing trick of stepping into someone else's story, that's still really good, even as an adult. Now, it doesn't happen with every single book, but it's good enough when it does happen to keep trying over and over again until you hit something that changes you, even in a small way. And my son had his first hit this summer with The Giver. You guys remember that one? And now he's turning into a reader too, addicted to the magic, just like his mom. And I bet, for those of you who are readers out there tonight, you can name the books that did it for you when you were young. So John Irving's book, A Prayer for Owen Meany, that was the first book I ever really loved. It was beautiful and heartbreaking and simply brilliant. I remember crying at the end, if you can believe it, and my dad's copy that I stole and read over and over again until it was ratty and dog-eared and falling apart is on my shelf at home, waiting for one of my kids to pick it up and discover it for themselves. So all of this to say, I'm really looking forward to Queen Esther. Mark your calendars for our People of the Book Club when it comes out. So this week, the New York Times put out a crowdsourced list of the best 100 books of the century. Did you guys see this? It's collected, yeah, from dozens of literary luminaries such as Stephen King, another one of my favorites, Roxane Gay, Min, Jin, Min Jin Lee, and you guessed it, my boy, John Irving. Now this is very exciting for a person like me, a person who loves reading and who takes book recommendations very seriously and who loves a summer reading project. These are a collection of books that made people feel things. People who make other people feel things with their writing, books that have made a major impact on the world around them. And it's a fascinating question. What makes something a good book, a great read, something that has staying power? So I asked a few of my reading friends about their favorite books and why they were their favorites. One responded that the book that she loves put into words so much of what she felt about the subject but didn't quite know how to express. One shared that she was drawn to the theme of the book, the theme of unwavering hope that things will be okay, despite venturing into the unknown, both literally and figuratively. And one answered that his world was broken open a little bit by the story, that he felt transported to a new place, 
had a different perspective and got a little taste of a different life once he was finished. And for another, she wrote, a great book brings a bit of meaning and beauty and sense of gratitude for this life that I am living. And so now we turn to arguably the greatest story ever told, one that did not make the top 100 of the century list because it is much, much, much older than that. And I'm sure you can guess where I'm going with this. Thank you, the Torah. Great job, Emma. But let's see if it meets all the requirements, okay? Puts into words things we feel but are often hard to express. Check. Themes of unwavering hope that things are going to be okay. Check. Offers the courage to venture into the unknown. Check. Transports us to a new place, offers a different perspective, gives a little taste of a different life. Check, check, check. Meaning, beauty, you bet. Gratitude in spades. The Torah, our sacred text, is in fact a really, really good read. And it has this incredible staying power for a reason, not just because, you know, it was given by God, but because the story itself is also really powerful. Now take this week's parsha, Chukat, for example. In this portion alone, we have a spectacular and complicated piece of our narrative. Miriam, Moses and Aaron's sister and prophetess of our people, she's just died. And thus far, she has been the one to provide the Israelites with water in the desert. If you've ever been to the Middle East this time of year, you know how important it is to have access to water. So it's been a rough time. Moses is grieving and the people are naturally whining their hearts out because that is what Jews do when we are hot and we are thirsty. <laughs> if only we had perished when our brothers perished, they cried. The paragraph, literally the paragraph right after Miriam dies and the water runs out. Why have you brought us into this wilderness for us and our animals to die here? Why did you make us leave Egypt in the first place to bring us to this wretched place, a place with no grain, no figs or vines or pomegranates? There is not even water to drink. So the brothers, Moses and Aaron, turn to God who instructs Moses to order a rock, we're going to pretend the speaker is a rock, to yield its water in front of the entire community both to provide them with this precious, life-giving resource and also to reassure the people that they're going to be okay. So you might know the rest of the story. Instead of ordering the rock to give water, Moses, he hits the rock. Where's Noreen? Yeah, where are you? Yeah. Hits the rock, right? He hits it twice. The rock pours out water, provides plenty for every animal and every human, and everybody feels a lot better. Everybody but God. God is really mad because Moses hit the rock. It wasn't cool. It wasn't what God told him to do. And so Moses is then told, because of that, well, Midrash says, because of that, he will not be allowed to enter the promised land. So harsh, like crazy harsh for this guy who just left his cushy palace life to lead the Israelites out of slavery and through the desert for the last 40 years. Now, I could give a whole sermon about this rock incident. In fact, many of your clergy spent a whole semester studying this very moment in rabbinical school, but I won't. Suffice it to say, this Torah portion alone could be 10 really great books. I haven't even touched on the red heifer, the death of Aaron, the poisonous snakes that God sent to punish the people for their insolence, and so on and so forth, all found in this week's text. We are so lucky beyond that this central document, this holy narrative, this life-giving story of our people, our history, our culture is our inheritance. It's engaging, it's relatable, it's human, and it's ours in all its complexity and splendor. When a child stands before their community on the bima to take their place in our chain of tradition, when someone who is choosing Judaism stands in front of our open ark, committing themselves to a life of Jewish engagement and learning, I like to remind them that this scroll is their narrative. It's their story. From our text, we glean so much about humanity, our value system, our relationship with God and with each other, but also we are part of the story. And arguably, that's really what makes it so very awesome. Each of us, every single person here, we all have our own story, yes. But we are part of this larger shared story too. Our stories wind through minutes, weeks, summers, lifetimes, and across generations. And they unfold through languages, both ancient and modern. And they shape us. They define us. When we tell and listen to our people's story, we create a deeper understanding of each other and ourselves. 
So whether you were moved and awakened by Catcher in the Rye or 1984, whether you are a red tent fanatic or your mind was blown by the giver like my kid, whatever it was, whatever it will be, know that the greatest story of all time is always here for you too, to serve as a deep and fulfilling foundation, to love us, to hold us accountable, to teach us lessons, to give our lives meaning, to connect us to the divine, and just as important, to connect us to each other. And in the words of my guy, John Irving, if you care about something, you have to protect it. If you're lucky enough to find a way of life that you love, you have to find the courage to live it. So may each of us protect our sacred Torah, this beautiful way of life, and may we each have the courage to live our lives with pride and honor each and every day. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>